May this time be spent to the glory of God and the upbuilding of his holy church. Amen. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Transfigured Life. My name is Luther. I'm here with Father Jonathan, and we have a special guest today. We have over here Father John Whiteford, uh, apologist, pastor, uh, you know, wise counsel he gives. Uh, thankful for you being here. Uh, how are you doing, Father John? I'm doing good. Thank you. Nice, nice, nice. Uh, Father Jonathan, um, you know, happy to see you as well as always. Uh, how's everything going with you? Uh, we just had a marvelous visit by our Archbishop, Archbishop Michael, this past Sunday for the uh, Feast of the Transfiguration, and it was just a, a marvelous day. New people showing up at the church. Um, j j wonderful time. It was really a wonderful day. God, God be praised. Wonderful. Nice, nice. Okay, awesome, awesome. Well, hey guys, uh, this episode here, what we want to do is, um, you know, we, we really want to deal with some objections from time to time against orthodoxy. Um, Father, I mean, I know you've seen things here and there. Uh, you know, Father Jonathan uh, has seen things here and there. You both actually are really big in apologetics, uh, have, you know, done things online, dealing with uh, common objections. Uh, Father Jonathan, I don't know if you, you had anything that you wanted to uh, you know, maybe pose at Father John, as you guys have been doing apologetics here and there for a while. Mm. So we have um, we have one one video that we would like to get your input on. <laughs> um, Luther, is is this someone we should be paying attention to? Is this someone we should be worried about? <laughs> with his arguments and his uh, his teachings out there. What do you think? Uh, definitely not worried about. Um, but I would say out of all the you know Protestant apologists. This would probably be one of the more respected ones in the sense of I, I feel like he puts some, uh, at least he he puts a really good effort out there, and so and he does it in a very charitable and ironic way. So, oh boy. <laughs> so um, yeah, we you know uh, definitely have uh, good things to say uh, on that note about uh, you know Dr. Gavin, but um, we do want to deal with this five minute case. I know a Protestant did share it with me and said, this is one of the reasons why, you know, they're still not headed towards the East. Um, but man, when I looked at the video, you know, I, you know, no offense, you know, I, I didn't feel like it, it, it was, it was what would keep somebody there. You know, I feel like there was a, there's a lot of, you know, things that were either distorted or not necessarily true, but we have none other than Father John, uh, John Whiteford with us and Jonathan. So we're going to we're going to tackle that today and just get right into it. Um, real quick, Father John, did you, you saw the video. So what was your immediate quick reactions when you saw that video? Uh, it, it was interesting that it seemed to be a lot more directed at Roman Catholicism than anything right. else. But it also was glossing over a whole lot of stuff was my was my initial reaction when it tried to make the case that uh, Protestantism is more ecumenical. It just glosses over the fact that John Calvin and Martin Luther were killing the spiritual forebears of Gavin Ortland's Baptist. You know, and, and the the only two countries that were allowing Baptists to live and uh, and uh, in, in live in peace was uh, Holland and Russia. <laughs> That's why you have a lot of Baptists in Russia is that is they, they basically told the Baptists, look, you can come and live in peace, mind your own business. We're not going to let you proselytize the Orthodox. But but, you know, if you want to uh, come here and, and farm, we'll let you we'll let you uh, have you, you. You can keep your religion. Right. Uh, and so there's a lot of Baptists that wound up in the Russian Empire. Mm -hmm. And uh, and. Uh, you know that's why people like Gavin Ortland are still they're still Baptists out there, as they weren't all killed off by Martin Luther and John Calvin. But they were earnestly trying; <laughs> right. they were earnestly trying to wipe out all those folks. Hmm. It's the the dark side of a uh, Protestant history that's not right. talked about sometimes. Right, you know? right, so, right. Um, but yeah, no. Let, let's. Uh, I'm gonna. So I'm gonna play the video and feel free to have it stopped at any time, any point that you want to bring up. And we'll just we should we should be able to knock it out in uh, within an hour or so. Sure. But yeah, let's uh you know get your thoughts and and let's uh, let's go. Let's, let's answer. It. <laughs> Protestantism is a branch of Christianity that traces its origins back to the 16th century Reformation in the Western Church. There are different Protestant traditions, but they share foundational commitments like the five solas, 
two sacraments, the priesthood of all believers, and many other doctrines. This video is going to suggest three reasons in about five minutes for why it makes sense to be a Protestant Christian. Number one, Protestantism is more Catholic. The word Catholic just refers to the entirety of the church. The major non-Protestant traditions like Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, Oriental Orthodoxy, the Assyrian Church of the East, all claim to be the one true church. Throughout the medieval era, pretty much all the Roman Catholics think that the non-Catholics are damned. Pretty much all the Eastern Orthodox think that the non-Orthodox are damned and so forth. And those views find their way into the highest levels of magisterial teaching. By contrast, Protestantism doesn't restrict the church to one institution. In the 19th century, the historian Philip Schaff argued for a vision of Protestantism as an organic renewal effort within the one true church. He called Protestantism the principle of movement, of progress in the history of the church, and spoke of its Catholic union with the past, insisting that the Protestant traditions have fundamental points of continuity with traditions outside Protestantism. Okay, People let's go ahead and pause it. To discover... Okay, um, notice that he jumps from the 16th century to the 19th century before he starts talking about how open-minded Protestants are. Right. Because uh, the fact of the matter is Protestants were killing each other uh, on a, a, in mass, and they had wars of religion that uh, went on for you know more than 100 years, almost continuously. And uh, what happened was, is in Germany especially, the modern university system was established. And uh, these universities were actually established to, uh, with one goal, is to make people less dogmatic. Because uh, the German rulers thought, well, the where's you are, we're having all these wars because people are so convinced that they're right, that they're killing each other. So let's have universities where we make people less sure of themselves. Mm -hmm. So this is where you really have the rise of skepticism uh, being promoted through academia. And there's a really good book. Uh, I believe it's the death of scripture and the rise of biblical studies. Uh, death and, of scripture and the rise of biblical studies. Right. Okay. And uh, it, it, the guy, his last name is escaping me, but he's now the Old Testament professor at St. Vladimir Seminary. I didn't even know that he was Orthodox when I read the wow. book initially, but I thought this book really does a great job of talking about where Protestantism uh, really started going down this road where you wind up with scholars that deny almost every aspect of the Christian faith. You look at Western Europe today, uh, the churches are empty, and uh, the, you know the great old old line denominations have almost completely abandoned everything about traditional Christianity. They don't believe the scriptures are especially inspired beyond above what the, you know, may, you might find in, in any other religious book. They deny in many cases, uh, the deity of Christ, uh, deny the, the literal resurrection of Christ. They've embraced, uh, you know, the LGBTQP uh, spectrum and all that kind of stuff. They've got lesbian, tranny, homosexual bishops and priests. Uh, so how, where did all that get started? Well, it got started then, and that was because you had these people that were trying to put a stop to all these wars among Christians, which had not been a problem, uh, you know, prior to the Protestant Reformation, at least not on the same scale. So, so and, Father John, let me, let me cut in here and, and let me play devil's advocate. Uh, with with what with, with what I think Gavin would respond to, and he might say, "Well, well, Europe is lost, but I'm talking about the church here in America. Here we still believe in God, and here we still blah blah blah." Uh, how would you? How would we answer that? How would you? Well, the thing is, you look at at every mainline denomination, with the exception of the Southern Baptist has gone down the road in the same direction. And you have to ask yourself, why is it that Protestants seem to inevitably wind up as liberal skeptics? And I think it's, an, it's, a, it's because of the inherent nature of Protestantism. The, the mm -hmm. Part of it is this enlightenment mentality that was really birthed out of Protestantism. Uh, uh, Protestantism was the uh, religious expre expression of secularism. It was sort of a scaffolding that made sec secularism possible. Right. Uh, 
but uh, even the Southern Baptists seem to be going down this road now. You know, the, the Southern Baptists were the, the exception, but now we're starting to see that a lot of the conservatives in the Southern Baptist Church are bailing on them because they're starting to see the same kind of stuff going on with them as you've seen go on with the mainstream Lutherans and Pe Presbyterians at the Episcopal Church. Uh, you know, th these things, are they're just uh, shells of what they used to be. When you're aware of what how how staunchly these people used to believe what they taught, and you compare that with what they say today, they almost believe in nothing anymore. Right. And, and uh, you know, and, and also I think it's a lot of wishful thinking on Gavin Ortland's part. I, I, I Googled his church and, and looked at a service just because I figured, you know, I, I wonder how traditional his services are. Well, he's got a rock band worship team hmm. that's leading his worship services. And he wants to try to convince us that, that he's in the tradition of the of the yep. of the fathers the and, the, and, and the undivided right. church. No, he is not. When I was studying to be a, a, a Nazarene minister, I remember that you know, even though my professors were liberal by Protestant sta by by Nazarene standards, they did foster sort of an interest in more liturgical worship, even though that was totally not the tradition of the Church of the Nazarene. The, the Nazarenes come out of the holiness movement, which is where the word holy roller comes, or the phrase holy roller comes from. And uh, so the, the Nazarene traditions is jumping the pews, waving your hankies, and and, uh, and ha shouting and hooting, you know, in your services. So there's nothing, there's not a liturgical bone in the body of anybody who's a traditional Nazarene. <laughs> And, uh, and the same thing goes for Baptists. They're, they don't have a traditional bone in their body as far as the, the services of the church are concerned. Well, wait, hold on here. Luther, can, can you imagine Father John hooting and hollering with the hankies and all that, like he just said? I, that, that, that's a mind-blowing <laughs> image right there. I don't know if I can take that. Well, by the time I was growing up, the Nazarenes were really not that way. I mean, occasionally you'd have people, you know, get a little bit more excited than normal in a service. But it, it they were not rolling in the aisles like they used to. I, mm. I worked for an old guy who was uh, his father was an old Nazarene evangelist in Bethany, Oklahoma, which was where I went to college. And he told me that back when he was a kid, there were tour bus buses from Oklahoma City that would come on a Sunday and people would come to Bethany Nazarene, Bethany's first church of the Nazarene to watch these wild services because they, wow. they wanted to see it for themselves. Yeah. And if you go to Bethany First Church of the Nazarene today, at least when I was there, it was like the most reserved services that you could possibly imagine. It was just traditional hymns, very nothing like that. But that's the way that they used to be. Uh, and, uh, you know, Baptists are, have never been into any kind of liturgics. It's basically white walls and a, and a sermon and some hymns. And, and many... Uh, more traditional Protestants wouldn't even, they thought hymns were kind of an innovation. They would just sing the Psalms only because they, they thought that anything else was going beyond scripture. Uh, mm -hmm. So their services were very bare bones. And, and so the idea that there's a historic continuity between, you know, Gavin Ortland's church and, uh, and uh, the, the, the early church, you, you just don't see it because the early church was the, the the central focus of their worship was the Eucharist, the liturgy. And you find that going back to St. Justin Martyr, you right. know, one of the earliest writers of the church, talk, he, he talks about this. St. Ignatius of Antioch, a okay. disciple of the Apostle John, talks about this. So we're not talking about these you know, late accretions that you know, when, the, when the Roman Catholic Church became corrupt, as Protestants used to like to say. Um, right. When I was a kid, you know, Jack Chick tracks and magazines were really yeah, popular. Yeah, I remember. And, I remember. Uh, and I remember, even as a Protestant, finding it a little bit funny that they had a magazine that was talking. It was in the Alberto Rivera series. Alberto Rivera was supposedly a Jesuit priest that had uh, yep. converted. And yep. uh, he was telling all the secrets of the of The, the Roman secrets Catholic of the Church. Vatican, yeah. You know, how, you know, how they would, you know, Monks and nuns would, uh, you know, have tunnels connecting the monasteries. They'd have babies together and then bury them out in the in the backyard, and you know that kind of stuff. Well, uh, he had a cover of one of his issues where these Christians are climbing up the side of a mountain, and it's all written in comic book format. So, uh, as as these Christians are climbing up the side of the mountain, obviously trying to get away from something, you might guess maybe there was a volcanic eruption or something, a forest fire, but. 
what, what does one say to the person behind him? Constantine's declared Christianity a state religion, <laughs> which didn't even actually happen. He just right. declared Const Christianity a legal religion. Uh, okay. Making it the state religion happened later. But, uh, but the whole idea, if you know church history, the idea that Christians who went through persecutions that were so severe that Roman uh, uh, civil magistrates we're trying to outdo each other with creative ways to torture Christians. And then when they started to slack off and they became a little bit more tolerant, they were just poking out their eyes and hamstringing them and sending them to work to death, be worked to death in a copper mine someplace. The idea that people who lived through that for, you know, a, a, you know, a couple of hundred years that, uh, that suddenly the thing that was going to make them flee up the mountainside to get away from civilization was that Constantine declared Christianity illegal. Now you're not going to you're not going to be burned at the stake. You're not going to be crucified. You're not going to have your eyes poked out and be hamstrung and sent to the copper mine. Oh, we can't handle that. We got to flee. You know that's that. It's just the most ridiculous thing that you ever heard. But that this is Baptist church history. If you ever want to read what Baptists historically have taught about church right, history. Trail the Trail of blood. of blood, which is a, a ridiculous book. It's funny. Yeah, that claims funny. almost every heresy that's ever existed as being the forebearers of the Baptist because they're trying right. to find where they were in church history, and they can't. They can't. <laughs> so they, they have to say that somehow the Montanists and the Donatists were both forebearers of the Baptist, even though the, the Donatists were like – more orthodox than the orthodox you know they were they were they were not at all like the baptist uh and uh you know to, to claim all these groups that had completely opposite opinions about things and say that these are the four of the baptist is just ridiculous but that's their view of church history wow wow that's wild that's wild okay let let me um let me put this the video back up okay. let's see here where we left off i'll mute my is true Christianity, even the right kind of Christianity. People are often surprised to discover that this is how the reformers thought. Luther said, in the papacy, there is true Christianity, even the right kind of Christianity, and many great and devoted saints. The Christendom that is now under the papacy is truly the body of Christ and a member of it. Calvin said, when we categorically deny to the papists the title of the church, we do not for this reason impugn the existence of churches among them. Similarly, both Calvin and Luther defended the ecclesial status of Eastern Orthodoxy against Roman Catholic claims of exclusivity. For example, Calvin said, they make the Greeks schismatics. With what right? Because in withdrawing from the apostolic see, they lost their privilege. What? Would not they who fall away from Christ deserve to lose it much more? Compare those statements with the pre-modern ways of thinking and the non-Protestant traditions, and you get two fundamentally different ways of construing Catholicity. Bottom line, if you are opposed to shrinking the church down to one institution, you should probably be a Protestant. Second. Well, notice that he, he presents modern thinking as being superior to pre-modern thinking. Well, you know what? When you read the Bible, you're not reading modern thinking. <laughs> you're reading pre-modern thinking because modern modernism or, you know, and light post enlightenment thinking is that kind of skeptic skepticism that I was talking about, where you basically have methodological uh, skepticism and you apply that to the faith and only the things that can survive your scrutiny. Are you going to concede any belief to? And that you eventually wind up with people becoming complete atheists as a result of that kind of an approach. That's not the kind, that's not the mindset you find in the Bible. That's also why you have Protestants that are so skeptical of anything that's uh, supernatural or miraculous. Uh, a, a conservative Baptist like Gavin Ortland would certainly affirm all the miracles in the Bible because, well, that's in the Bible, so it must be true. But it's like, they, they literally say that after the canon was closed, the age of miracles ceased. And uh, so we don't have to worry about miracles now. And uh, apparently the demons stopped attacking people, too, uh, because you read about demons attacking people all the time in the Gospels. 
uh, but you don't hear about that among the Baptists unless they're like Bapticostals, you know, that, that are, are changing things up a bit. But traditional Baptists, they're, they're essentially empiricists in terms of their day-to-day life, but up above, they believe that God is up there. And, uh, and so they'll, they, they believe there's this realm of the supernatural uh, up there. And then there's the empirical down here, but there's no real connection between those two things. God might occasionally answer your prayers, but he's not going to do it in a very miraculous way. There's going to be a natural explanation for it. Uh, It might just be a fortuitous series of events, but you're not going to see anything really spectacular uh, as a result of prayer. Whereas in the Orthodox Church, one of the things that I found very interesting when I became Orthodox was, was how routine the miraculous is in the Orthodox church. You know, we have uh, saints that work miracles in our own time and in recent memory. And we talk about this as not being odd because this is what's been happening throughout church history. We have icons that are mer streaming that people get healed by on a regular basis. And it's almost like, okay, well, that's normal for us. Uh, But in Protestantism, or at least in, in the branch of Protestantism that Gavin belongs to, there's really this post enlightenment skepticism that uh, that is totally foreign to the to the mindset of the Bible, and uh, and 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 this is something that Protestants really have to understand. And when people are converting to Orthodoxy, I talk to them about it being a worldview shift, because it's not that we cease to be people who live in the modern era and are aware of things like you know med- you know modern medicine and the laws of physics and stuff like that, but you have to open up your mind to the miraculous to even be able to see it. If you think about Eskimos, for example, when an Eskimo looks out in the world that they live in and they see all the snow and ice that they see, they see different kinds of snow and ice because they they live in that world and it's very important to them to pay attention to the differences between those things. Whereas if you go to equatorial Africa, they have only one word for ice, snow, hail, and sleet because they don't have a lot of ice in equatorial Africa. So that's not as big of a deal for them to make those kinds of distinctions. Right. And so someone from equatorial Africa would not see the same thing that an Eskimo sees when he looks out on the snow. And uh, someone who has blinded themselves to the miraculous is never going to see the miraculous because they're always going to just explain it naturally or dismiss it. They're, 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 they've shut their minds off to that whole reality. And that's not the mindset you find in the Bible. Right, right. No, that's a good point, Father. Good point. Um, I noticed his, his idea of like the church, how he kind of merges all these groups together. Can you, can you speak to this idea more of the invisible church and how he almost, he's making a case for Protestantism as if they're a group, but he know like as they're one you know, group with, you know, yeah. the same faith. When we know well, scripture says something different, you know, one faith, one Lord, mm-hmm. one baptism, like in Ephesians uh, 4, right. one, can you speak some more to? Well, as I mentioned, it's, it's kind of ironic that he as a Baptist quotes Martin Luther and John Calvin as being these ecumenically minded people when they were trying to destroy his f- spiritual forebears from off the face of the earth. But the other thing is the Baptists weren't particularly more tolerant than the Lutherans and the, uh, and the Calvinists. Some of them were pacifists. So mm-hmm. on principle, they didn't believe in using the power of the state to go after people. And most Baptists have always had a skepticism of being uh, the state getting involved in religious affairs because their experience for most of their history of the state getting involved in religious affairs resulted in them being persecuted in some kind of a way. But, uh, but Baptists don't, didn't historically think that Roman Catholics were okay. They thought that they were apostates and they were all going to hell. And they would have said the same thing about the Orthodox, and they would have said the same thing about a lot of the Protestants, too. You baptize babies. You know better than the Catholics. Mm-hmm. Uh, so and I, the, the, when I was raised in the Nazarene Church, that was, they're not, I would say this mentality is probably not very common anymore, but I was raised to think that Roman Catholics were all going to hell, that they were idol worshipers. And Gavin Ortland, he spent quite a bit of time talking about why he doesn't believe iconography is okay. And he makes the argument that we are idolaters. Well, if we're idolaters, if he believes what he's saying, how can he say, well, we're brothers in the, in the Lord? We, we're, we're part of the same church. St. Paul you know, makes it pretty clear that if you're an idolater, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. You know? So, so if, if we're idolaters, we're, we, we're going to hell if you believe the Bible to be true. 
but yet he somehow wants to use that kind of a polemic to say that we're idolaters, but then say, well, I'm, I, I'm all for being ironic. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to come off like I'm condemning people. Uh, okay. You, you just condemned us as idolaters. That sounds pretty condemnatory. Uh, but somehow you're going to try to say that you think that we're still brothers in the Lord. I, I don't think that you can really make that kind of an argument when you, when you make those kinds of accusations. Right. So let's uh let's continue on there. Relation to church history. Cardinal Newman famous second reason, Protestantism has a more realistic and compelling relation to church history. Cardinal Newman famously said to be deep in history is to cease to be a Protestant. And to be sure, many contemporary Protestants do have a shallow historical consciousness. But Protestantism as such was nothing other than an effort of historical retrieval. The magisterial reformers appealed to the church fathers just as much and sometimes more than they appealed to scripture to oppose what they saw as the novel accretions and innovations of the medieval West. Things like the following seven examples. Number one, the financially abusive system of salvation involving indulgences, the treasury of merit, masses for the dead to reduce time in purgatory, and so forth. Number two, transubstantiation as the required mechanism for real presence in the Eucharist. Number three, papal infallibility. Number four, that the number of sacraments is seven. Number five, cultic practices like the veneration of icons. Number six, withholding communion in both kinds, that is, in both bread and wine from the laity. Number seven, the elaborate role assigned to Mary in the piety and dogma of the church. None of those issues has a solid basis in patristic Christianity. Now, to be clear, church history is... That's a pretty ridiculous argument to make about the Virgin Mary, because you find the Virgin Mary very consistently uh, uh, just talked about by the fathers of the church. As a matter of fact, we had the Third Ecumenical Council that was primarily focused on the issue of whether the Virgin Mary was Theotokos or Christotokos. In other words, was she the mother of God or was she just the mother of, of Christ? And uh, so, so to, to act like, well, this is not a big deal, it's just not true. And, and uh, the Protestant, if you look at the Philip Schaff edition of the Fathers, you don't find as much stuff about the Virgin Mary in there as because it was collect. These are collections of the fathers by Presbyterians and Episcopalians of, back when they still believe in God and stuff. Uh, but they, they selected writings of the fathers that they liked and they did not select writings of the fathers that they didn't like. So for, for example, there are a lot of homilies on the lives of the saints that St. John Chrysostom preached but they're not found in the Schaff edition. He, so if you, if you thought that that was the complete collection of St. John Christen's writings, you would, uh, you would be mistaken. And also, if you look at the, uh, that, that, I think it's one of the Anti-Nicene Fathers volumes that has text of the various ancient liturgies. And in those texts, you'll find prayers to the Mother of God reduced to footnotes and why are they in footnotes? Not because they find manuscripts in which those prayers are not found. They just say, well, this obviously reflects a later uh, understanding of the Virgin Mary that wouldn't have been present. So they just take it out of the text because they, their a priori assumption is, is that, well, this couldn't have been true, that this would have been in part of this liturgy in ancient times. Well, well, Father John, we have to use one of Gavin's preferred words. And Luther knows it very well. It's an accretion. Right. Right. Like the book, the epistle of St. James, you know, that was one of other Luther's other uh, accretions that he was un, not happy with. Uh, so th they, they, they were very selective in what they collected and they ignored a lot of stuff that they didn't want to talk about. And, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you one, let's just take one issue of tradition that almost every pr Protestant rejects, and that's prayers for the dead. Um, there are some Protestants that do it. I know the Anglicans started to do it at a certain point. I don't think that, that was even historically true of them. But 
certainly among evangelicals, you don't see them praying for the dead because it goes totally against their theology because they think that salvation is completely about your relationship with Jesus. You say the magic words, you're saved, and that's the end of the story. So the idea that people who are departed might benefit in some way from prayer is a foreign concept to them. You find prayers for the dead throughout church history very clearly being talked about, and you arguably find it in the New Testament, and you certainly find it in the Deuterocanonical books. Uh, so prayers for the dead is, is, is one of the easiest things to prove that Christians have always done it. And the Jews do it, and Muslims do it. So, so in every branch of ancient Christianity does it. So, so you know, all the, the, the groups that he mentions as the various branches, you know, the, the Nestorians have almost ceased to exist for all practical purposes, but he mentions them. But, you know, the Monophysites still have some numbers of some significance. And, of course, you have the Roman Catholics and you've got us. There's not a single one of these groups that does not pray for the dead. There's also not a single one of these groups that doesn't ask the Virgin Mary for her prayers. And uh, so you have to start thinking, well, how is it that all these groups happen to have the same beliefs on these things? The Nestorians broke off at the time of the Third Ecumenical Council. So they were no longer in the same stream theologically as the rest of the church. And the Monophysites broke off at the time of the yeah. Council of uh, Chalcedon. So how is it that they still believe these things if you're saying that these things all happen later on? Well, they didn't, this is, is the answer to the question. They, they go back a lot further because otherwise we wouldn't have these common uh, beliefs. And then, Father John, that's the same argument Luther brought up when we were talking about icons and trying to uh, respond to Gavin. Uh, that, you know, he, he's attacking the Eastern Orthodox for having icon veneration. But then how do you explain uh, the non-Chalcedonians and their iconography and iconology that goes back just as far? Right. And the Nestorians have it, too. I remember a while back talking to a Protestant that thought the Nestorians did not have icons. And I was able to show them that they, they do. Even like at one time they had a presence in China of some size oh. and they had icons in China. As a matter of fact, one interesting fact about the Nestorians and their their uh, connection with China is in Chinese Buddhism, their uh, their image of the Bodhisattva in, in in Indian Buddhism is of a woman with a child. In traditional Hin in Buddhism and in every other form of Buddhism, it's a man that's depicted as the Bodhisattva, which is an emanation of the Buddha, as they would put it. Well, Guan Yin in Chinese Buddhism is depicted as a woman with a child, and the, the Bodhisattva is the merciful emanation of Buddha. And the fact that Christians in China were venerating the Virgin Mary caused the Buddhists to start thinking of, of associating mercy with this image of this woman with this child. And actually, there are Nestorian images of uh, the Nativity or of icons of the Virgin Mary that you, that scholars have unearthed in China, and they've made the connection. This is where the, the, the image of Guan Yin comes from, is from these this Nestorian practice. And so contrary to Jack Chick, who likes to point to pagan images that look like the Virgin Mary and say, well, see, the Christians were just being paganized. The other way around. It was the other way around entirely. <laughs> and... Uh, so, so obviously they had images. You, you, you can't say that it happened later. You can't say it happened in the 7th or the 8th century if, if uh, the historians have the same customs. Right. Well, let's complete our review of this video. It's complicated. It doesn't neatly or consistently serve as a support to any one side in the current debates. But Protestants can simply accept that messiness because tradition is not for us an infallible guide. That leads to the third point. Protestantism places Holy Scripture over the authority of the church. This does not mean that we reject tradition wholesale, but it does put Scripture in a unique position of paramount authority, because we recognize that only the words of Scripture are God-breathed, carried along by the Holy Spirit, the oracles of God. Jesus quoted the Old Testament as God speaking and warned against elevating tradition to a role that nullifies the word of God. There we go. Put it simply, we as 
Well, what he's saying there, of course, is ridiculous because he's only talking about the negative uh, form of tradition that Christ was attacking, which were called traditions of men. <laughs> Whereas St. Paul talks about tradition quite a bit in the positive sense. And he says, I passed on to you. And the word passed on there is the verbal form of tradition. I passed on to you the traditions that I received from Christ. So, so he's basically saying the, there's the traditions of Christ that you are supposed to follow. And in first Corinthians 11, he says, I praise that you follow the tradition just as you receive them from me. In second Thessalonians two 15, he says, hold fast to the, to the traditions that you receive from me, whether by word or our epistle. So he's putting scripture on the same level as oral tradition and he's calling them both tradition. So scripture is not above tradition. Scripture is tradition. It's the highest part of tradition, you could say. But it doesn't make sense apart from the rest of the tradition. And when he says we accept tradition as having authority, we just don't put it on the same level as scripture. What they're really saying is, is they're saying when I see uh when I'm reading the scriptures and the church fathers and the tradition of the church contradicts my interpretation, I take my interpretation over the church fathers because you're begging the question. If you say, I take the scriptures over the church fathers because the, the fathers don't see it that way. The fathers think that what they're saying is consistent with what the scriptures teach. The fathers never, you'll never find any church father say, well, the scriptures say this, but we can disregard that because we don't think that's really as important as our traditions which are superior to this. The traditions that we have are always uh, connected to Scripture and explain Scripture, and uh, they're, they're not separate from that. And going back to the prayers for the dead, if, if, he, if Gavin Ortland took tradition at all seriously, if it was any kind of a guide for how you understand Scripture, then he would have to, he would have to be praying for the dead. If, if tradition was any kind of a guide for Gavin Ortland, he would have to believe that the Eucharist was really the body and blood of Christ, because that's one of the, the easiest things to prove from the earliest records of the church is that we believe the, that the, that the, commun the Eucharist is not just a memorial, which is what Baptists normally teach. Gavin might dance around this and say, well, some of us believe in the real presence of Christ. Well, that's not what Baptists have historically taught. You, you, you can blow smoke right. up the right. you know up the rear of some people but i was a baptist not i was raised nazarene but i actually attended baptist churches when i was living in areas where there was no nazarene church to go to and i know exactly what they taught and how they believed and practically speaking nazarenes uh were just uh methodists with baptist tendencies you know they 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 <laughs> they, 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 they worship the exact same way as the baptist their theology on eternal security and stuff was different, but but in terms of their day to day practice and worship, you'd have been hard pressed to tell the difference. And uh, so it's just he he he's he's got this fantasy that he's somehow connected to this the the tradition of the church when it's so clear that he has no right. connection to it. I guarantee you. I guarantee if you take any saint from any period of the first thousand years of church history, and you drop them into Gavin Ortland's church yeah, and had, a, had an interpreter that was able to explain to him what was going on. They would say, what in the world is right. this? This yeah. is not, this is not Christianity. <laughs> right. So right. It, it just does not work. And, and another problem with his view of, of the church is just this whole idea that you can have different denominations don't agree on anything doctrinally, but they're all still part of this invisible church. That is not the view of the church that you find in the new Testament. And it's not the view of the church that you find in the church fathers. When the Nicene Creed says, I confess one holy Catholic and apostolic church, they did not include in that the Donatist or the Montanist or any other schismatic or heretical group. They didn't say, well, you know, the, Don the Donatist, they, they don't agree with us, but they still love the Lord. And, you know, they're just as much part of the church as we are. They did not say that. So if you say you believe the Nicene Creed and you and you believe that, you can be in different denominations and not agree on the faith. You don't believe the Nicene Creed. You're kidding right. yourself because that's not what the Nicene Creed says. Right. You were going to say something, Father Jonathan. I keep I, talking over you. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I'm, I'm like, I'm like going, yeah, you know, and, <laughs> and I agree with what you say because, you know, it, there's, there's a lot of, of, of Protestants who will say, yeah, we, we can confess the Nicene Creed. You may be confessing with your mouth something that you don't believe. 
Because if you really examine what certain terms mean, one, holy, Catholic, apostolic, then, then you would realize that what you're in is not the one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. Right. And what, one thing I should have said when I was talking about how I became Orthodox is really a crucial turning point for me was when I read the epistles of St. Ignatius of Antioch. And when I read mm -hmm. those epistles, and he, this was the disciple of the Apostle John, Bishop of Antioch, at that time the most important center of Christianity in the church, and he was made the Bishop of Antioch by the Apostle John, so presumably St. John thought that he knew what he was talking about. Right. When I read his epistles, I knew that I was not in the same church that he was in. Right. <laughs> so I knew I could not remain a Protestant. I wasn't sure what I was going to become, but I knew I couldn't stay Protestant because I figured if we're not in the same church, St. Ignatius is more likely to be in the right church than me because he was a disciple of the Apostle John. Well, Father John, shameless plug for our own channel, The Transfigured Life. Our first episode was called Whatever Happened at the Church the Apostles Left Behind. So... We've uh, we've talked about that. That's actually a topic very near and dear to my heart, and I find it's something that Protestants don't know, don't understand, and are fascinated to, to learn more about. Right. Father Jonathan, it's interesting that you brought up St. Ignatius because he, he talks about in his letters, like, without a bishop, there's no church. You know, and so one could ask, well, who's who's Dr. Gavin's bishop? You know, or... he also he also says no one who follows another into a schism will inherit the kingdom of God. No one who follows heretical doctrine is on the side of the passion. Right. And so he clearly had an idea that there was one church that was in communion with itself that believed the same things, contrary to Gavin. And uh, mm -hmm. The Protestants can't even possibly commit the sin of schism at this point because they have so many denominations mm -hmm. yeah. that they, they don't really have a concept of schism being a thing. And yet it's talked about in the New Testament. St. Saint, Saint Ignatius thought it was a pretty significant thing if you won't inherit the kingdom of God if you're going into schism. And yet for Protestants, there's hardly anything more natural than starting a new denomination because you get fed up with the one that you're in because it's right. becoming liberal like all the other Protestant denominations. So you want to start a new one that's going to be conservative and won't go down the same road as those folks. Right. It's like a new church planning network, like every 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 month or something like that. You right. Know? It's like Acts, right. Acts 32, Acts 34. You know, it's just yeah. like. Right. Um, but he did say something I, I think is important that we respond to. Um, so he said something to the effect of, oh, well, you know, the church fathers, it's, it's, it gets a little messy. So not anybody can kind of claim one thing. Can, can you kind of speak to that a little bit? Uh, I guess that's his little argument to kind of it's weird because earlier he was almost making a case like there's there's a sense where the fathers agree with them and then now it's like well but there is some things that get get a little murky so we all no one can really you know put a foot or claim you know the fathers what would you say to that well the church fathers are very messy if you're a protestant evangelical and you're trying to hang on to that because you're going to find stuff that contradicts what you believe all the time in the fathers right. The fathers disagreed on certain issues, but if you're talking about real church fathers, the issues that they disagreed upon would all be relatively minor questions. Right. Uh, and so what uh, St. Vincent of Lorenz said about his definition of Catholicity was is that the, what, what is Catholic is what has always been believed by all everywhere. And by that, he doesn't mean by all outside of the church. He's talking about within the bounds of the church. This is the consistent belief that everybody has held. And uh, so if you find one father in isolation that makes a statement that sounds kind of strange, but then you don't find any other father saying that, well, then you say, well, you know, that was this father's opinion, but that's not the consensus of the fathers. But right. when it comes to the question of is there only one church that's in communion with itself and believes the same basic doctrines, you're not going to find pe church fathers saying, I don't believe that. I think that, you know, there are different denominations. I think those uh, Donatists are just as much a part of the church as we are. They just, you know, we have this disagreement. They, none of them say that. The, the, the kind of things that they disagreed about were more often pastoral matters that you might have a there might be a theological element to it because be how do you apply uh the the teachings of the church to this pastoral question like for example you did have a debate in the early church about should converts from heretical groups be baptized when they come into the church or should they be received by some form of economia 
And some father said, no, they should all be baptized. And some said they should, if they were baptized properly, they should never be baptized when they come into the church. And then you basically had St. Basil that came up with the view that the church followed, which was, well, it depends. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> and, and so the church you know, looks at the situation and makes its own judgment. Uh, but in, in the grand scheme of things, that's a fairly minor disagreement compared to, say, Calvinists versus Armenians. You know, I was I was raised to believe that uh, we had free will and that God desired the salvation of everybody and that anyone who went to hell went to hell because they chose to reject the grace and the light that God had given them. Calvinists were taught and are still taught the real Calvinists that from all eternity, God decided who was going to be saved and the vast majority of people were going to be damned. And it was irrespective of any decision or action or choice on their part. And, uh, and that there was nothing anybody could do about it. It was just, that was the way that it was. And so the vast majority of the human race could never have chosen to be saved, could never respond to the gospel. And when they, when they die and stand before the final judgment, they're going to be sentenced to an eternity in hell even though they never could have had even the possibility of ending up in a different situation, that God for all eternity, his glory will be affirmed by the fact that they're roasting on a spit in hell for, for all mm -hmm. eternity. And that's not, th those are two very different views of God that are, they're not minor differences. Right. And what's interesting about Calvinism and at least in America is Calvinism almost completely died off. There are very few hardcore Calvinists that were left by the, the early 20th century and uh the but then died off it almost did but what happened was is as liberalism started to 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 become more dominant in a lot of the mainstream denominations a lot of protestants found that those calvinists were the only ones that still believed in anything and so they they winded they, they ended up going drifting back towards calvinism uh, because they, they, they did believe that Christianity was true, and there were still this group of people that was still saying, yeah, Christianity is true, and doctrine does matter. And, and so that's why Calvinism has had sort of a second life. But I grew up never having known a full, Cal a, a full five-point Calvinist my entire life until I was in college. I'd been reading about Calvinism and, and studying the arguments that the Armenians used to have with Calvinists. And then one day I was in a bookstore and some guy struck up a conversation with me and come to, be, to, to find out the guy was an old timey five point Calvinist. And for me, it was like the guy in Jurassic Park that had been reading about dinosaurs all of his life. And all of a sudden there's a dinosaur running across the grass. Woo! Mm -hmm. Never seen that before. I'd never mm -hmm. seen a five point Calvinist in my entire life until I met this guy. <laughs> but now they're becoming much more common. Very uh, but that's because Protestant liberalism is going the direction that they're going. And so people who believe in God do believe that got, there has to be true somewhere. And uh, so a lot of them try to find that in Calvinism, but a lot, that's the reason why a lot of them are becoming Orthodox, too. Right, right. Well, let, let's, let's finish our video. I think we have one or two more uh, minutes uh, here, Father. We want you to give a comment on. the church have no rule of faith that is comparable in authority to the very words of God that we have in scripture. Protestantism makes sense because it keeps that authority uppermost and thereby keeps us accountable to the apostolic deposit. Mm. To sum up, Protestantism is first a renewal within the church, second a removal of historical accretions, and third a return to the authority of scripture. It makes sense to be a Protestant because it has a more compelling appeal to Catholicity, history, and scripture. You got to give them an A for effort on the graphics there. Yeah, it was very well done uh, in terms <laughs> of the presentation. It's just uh, pretty fantastic in terms of the things that they're asserting. You know, Protestantism probably could never have arisen in church history prior to the invention of the, of the printing press, because the idea that the average person was going to read the Bible for themselves wasn't even that much of a possibility. Although you, you do find St. John Chrysostom telling people back when, if you, to buy a complete copy of the Bible, an average working man would have had to work for about 80 years of his life, not never taken a day off, never spent any money on anything else. And then at the end of his 80 years of laboring in the fields, he could put his money on the counter and say, give me one of those Bibles over there. 
And that, that's how hard it was to get a Bible back in his day. But he encouraged people to at least get part of the Bible and read it at home. So, so we've always encouraged people to read the Bible that had access to it. And when the printing press came on the stage, the Orthodox were happy to start publishing Bibles so that people could read them too. But, uh, but Protestantism, in the form that it, it came to exist at the time of the Reformation, just could not have existed in, a, in, in the context of communities where not everybody had their own copy, so therefore everybody could just sit down and study, come up with their own ideas and uh, go from there. Yeah. So it, it's, it's a, and, and he clearly, uh, he, he's, 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 he's embracing the modernism that he's a part of. He's presenting that as being somehow superior to the, the, the mindset of the, the church prior to the enlightenment. It's like, let me offer you this. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's... When, when, Ask yourself, Gavin, if you if you ever watch this video, ask yourself, which mindset is more like the mindset you find in the Bible? Mm. <laughs> Enlightenment mentality or the Christian uh, mentality of the first uh, you know, millennium and a half, let's say, right. uh, or at least the first millennium for sure. I, I, you, I think you'd have to conclude that, that St. John Christen was a lot closer in mindset to the people in the Bible than uh, than Baptist in the post enlightenment uh, period. Amen. Yeah, the, this idea of contending for the faith right. once yeah. once delivered to the saints. Once right. and for all time. Once and for all time. And basically what what you have to believe to be a a, a Protestant like Gavin is is that uh, for most of church history most people were just totally lost and deluded and they were idolaters and uh, had no idea of the gospel. And he, he maybe will try to do the trail of blood thing on some level and say, well, there were a few people here, a few people there. But only only when Martin Luther comes on the scene uh, do, does someone start rediscovering the gospel. And the Baptists only survive because Martin Luther failed in trying to wipe them all out. But but somehow that's when the gospel was rediscovered. And prior to that, nobody understood it. even even the earliest people in, in church history that knew the apostles, they didn't really understand the gospel because apparently the apostles were such poor teachers of the, of the gospel that no one really understood it until uh, Martin Luther came along. Well, Father John, don't you know that most manuscripts miss the, the proper uh, Greek, which says in the words of our Lord, I will build my church by the 15th century. You see, that those words are missing. <laughs> 16. And another thing he d that Protestants don't don't take into account is where did they get their Bible from? They got their Bible from the church that they say became totally corrupt. Well, if the church totally became corrupt. How do you know you don't have a corrupt Bible? Facts. Uh, you know, it, it, it'd be like saying, you know, I'm going to get my Bible from the Church of uh, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and, and uh, trust them for it. I wouldn't. I wouldn't go to the Jehovah's <laughs> Witness and trust their Bible. Uh, so, so why would you think that for... You know, more than a thousand years, the church has been corrupt and worshiping idols, and somehow they preserved the Bible in in in, in its purity. Right. It, it just doesn't make any sense. Right. And then and the they will respond. Not... Well, God somehow used a corrupt church to, you know, <laughs> it's a renewal effort in the, and that's the funny thing. He says it's a renewal effort in the in the true church. How like how does that make sense? Like if the if the church has been corrupted, like. How do you not know, like, how can you now at that point determine what is? Well, like... th th there's absolutely no continuity with right. their church and the in the early church. When, when I went to my first Orthodox service, I, I thought this is this is real worship. And one thing that struck me, I'd read a lot about synagogue worship and the Old Testament temple worship. And I was immediately saw stuff that said this is this is like stuff that you would see in a synagogue. Right. And, uh, you know, the. The liturgical scholars have noted that there are a lot of prayers that we do in our services that have uh, verbal parallels with prayers that the Jews still do in their synagogue worship, and there's obviously a common origin to these prayers. Right. So the question you ought to ask is, how is it that the Orthodox wound up with Jewish uh, services that are based on the synagogue and the temple? H how does that happen? Was this a later accretion? Was there some point after the time of Constantine where the Christians said, you know what, those Jews do some pretty cool stuff. Let, let, let's, let, let's just check out what they're doing and see what we can plagiarize from them. 
Right. It would not have happened because the Christians and the Jews, even in the time of the New Testament, by the time you get to the end of the New Testament period, the relationship between the synagogue and Christians was already pretty much gone. Christians were not going to synagogues to pray because they were not welcome. So they parted company very early on. And at no point after that would Christians have ever been uh, inspired to say, let's go look what the Jews are doing and copy them. The only explanation for that is that this comes through, through the apostles who were Jews. That th This is how this wound up being the way that we worship God. And you don't see that in Gavin's church. You know, the, the guitar strumming stuff, there's nothing like that in a traditional Jewish synagogue service or in the Old Te Testament uh, temple. Uh, and, there, and there's certainly nothing historical about it, but we have this historic continuity with the worship of the apostles that we preserved. And uh, so it, it, for him to say that it's a renewal effort, it's just, it's just historical nonsense. It's, it's <laughs> fantasy land stuff, and, and, and it's wishful right. thinking. I, I, would, I suspect that you know, he seems to be a, a well-educated person, yes. and probably he would like his services to be a little bit more liturgical. He would like to incorporate some stuff, yeah. but probably his people don't. <laughs> Right. Uh, because, as I said, I, I went to school with people who got interested in liturgical worship because of their education, but then they would go into lo local Nazarene churches and try to introduce that stuff, and Nazarenes were not into that. You know, that mm -hmm. wasn't the hanky-waving stuff that Grandma used to do. We're not, that's that's looked pretty Catholic to me. Right. And, and so they usually became failures as a result, but if they tried to do that or else they just gave up, and then they, they, they went with the, uh, the, the, the mainstream. But uh, but but our worship, you know, we have this continuity and they don't. So th why is that? It, it has to be because of the apostles and we preserved it and they've not. Mm. That's good. And like Luther said earlier to our, our viewers listening right now, remember that it says in the scriptures that the faith that we believe in, that we practice, was delivered once and for all time once. to the church, to the church. And there was no second delivery, or, nope. uh, you or know, doctoral development. No, no refund after <laughs> after you know one century, and get a new one shipped out in the fifteenth <laughs> or, or sixteenth century. None of that mm. was was happening. Yeah, Luther, and also the faith once delivered thoughts? unto the saints. The word delivered there is again that verbal form of the word tradition. Tradition. Right. The mm. faith was once traditioned unto the saints. Right. And so if you're if you're poo pooing tradition you are not interestingly contending for the faith that was once traditioned in the saints. Very good way. Very good way to put it. Good Luther, stuff. any final comments or thoughts? Yeah, well, uh, I think we, we dealt with the five minute video and I know we probably went, uh, you know, through, but it was very important that we, uh, we, we, we get all that in there. And um, yeah, I think, I think, thank you, Father uh, Whiteford for that. Uh, Father Jonathan as well. Um, and we, we do want to put it out there, you know, um, you know, if, if a Protestant ends up watching this and they have any anything that they feel like makes a case for Protestantism, please feel free to leave it in the comments. We will gladly address it. And um, we will address it respectfully. Yeah, <laughs> yeah respectfully. Yeah. And this and this video wasn't like, you know, it's not a, a knock on Dr. Gav, like as as um, Father John Whiteford said, you know, very intelligent uh, uh, man and where, you know, you know, I'm sure he's an uh, awesome guy. This is just this is just dealing with Protestantism in general. It's not focused on a person, more so the belief system. And so um, we, we just want to see people come to the church, the Orthodox Church, the, the, the church that Christ has established um, since the day of Pentecost. And so um, we, we, that's, that's really what we want to do there. And just a little thing that we, last thing I'll say is, you know, we want, we want all the smoke. So if there's, if there's an argument <laughs> against Orthodoxy, feel free. We'd love to engage it in a nice, respectful, ironic way. So, And uh, folks, we would love to have you subscribe to our channel. We're trying to put out good content, great content even, uh, to answer questions, uh, to raise good discussion topics that, that people who are searching uh, and who are finding the Orthodox faith and can get some of their questions answered. So subscribe, give us uh, your ideas if you have uh, someone you'd like to see on or a topic you'd like us to discuss. We are very open to all of that. Thank you for watching this very much. We appreciate it. And Father John, thank you for your time. Thank you for, for being on The Transfigured Life. This was really a treat, and uh, we, we're so appreciative of your time and your, um, your experience and your expertise. Well, thanks for having me on.
Okay, everybody, until the next time, God bless you and uh, live that transfigured life. <laughs>